Hey everyone, Nathan Long here, president of Saybrook University. Welcome to another episode of Saybrook Insights. Today I'm meeting with a faculty student duo, Dr. Kirk Schneider and Mr. Tyler Gamlin. We're going to dig in a bit on the idea of life enhancing anxiety, depth healing, and Dr. Schneider's proposal that we form a national core of depth healers. What seems like a heady concept on first blush really does offer a lot in terms of practical applications supporting all of our communities. Definitely, this is an important leg to our work in advancing the mental health and well-being of the communities we serve. All right, let's get to it with Dr. Kirk Schneider and Mr. Tyler Gamblin. Well, this is a treat today on Saybrook Insights. I was approached by this dashing young gentleman, Tyler Gamblin, uh, at a recent residential learning experience, and he was evangelizing to me <laughs> this idea of core of depth healers. And I said, well, that sounds really intriguing. He said, it's so intriguing. I need to be on your podcast with Dr. Schneider. <laughs> and so I am thrilled to have both of you on. Tyler, Dr. Schneider, thank you for being here. Thank you so, so much, uh, Nathan. It's, it's great to have you here. So we'll kick it off, Dr. Schneider. Welcome back. You were a previous guest not long ago on Saybrook Insights. Uh, so maybe you could briefly talk to our audience, uh, who are many Saybrookians, but also uh, out in the world, about your background and specifically your affiliation with Saybrook University. Well, my background is extremely fortunate. I came to Saybrook, which was then the Humanistic Psychology Institute, in 1980 and had the wondrous opportunities to work closely with James Bugenthal and Roland May at Stanley Kripfer at uh, Minman. And uh, my, my first course was a, a nine-month-long mentorship with James Bugenthal. Really oh, wow. got me centered on existential humanistic therapy. And eventually I became an adjunct faculty at Saybrook. Of course, I feel very close to the school and to you all in the community. And uh, I continued to uh, work uh, mainly uh, supervising dissertations uh, at Saybrook. Uh, I also am uh, was an adjunct faculty member at Teachers College Columbia, which was very special for me. It's where Raul, Raul May graduated as well. So I have to walk those halls. And, and I'm currently a licensed psychologist and very involved in applying depth principles of practice to social crises, which is the focus I know of our interview today on Core of Depth Dealers. That's great. We, there are no shortages, or is no shortages of crises in the world right now. So, For sure. Uh, not least of which the current Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, uh, I think now a war, uh, as we're speaking today. So... Thank you, Dr. Schneider, and, and really looking in, looking forward to getting into this topic. So, Tyler, M Mr. Gamlin, you are um, one of our uh, fabulous students at Saybrook University. Maybe give us just a little bit of a rundown of your previous work, academically, anything personally that's of interest, and how you found yourself coming to the university. Yeah, well, originally, uh, when I started in college, I was a music major, and I was feeling um, not very motivated to go to school. I love music, still play. And I found myself in a, a psychology um, lecture one day. And by the end of the, the lecture, I switched majors. Oh, yeah, I'm a psychology major now and had a big interest in existentialism at the time. I was, was not aware that you can pair the two. I thought that it was like there's existential philosophy and then there's psychology. And I got my undergrad in psychology and, and a master's. And there was about an eight-year gap between my master's and and um, starting here at Saybrook. I'm finishing up my first year now. And in that time, I worked as a case manager. I worked for a medical device company, something called TMS. So I would I would service the machines and teach doctors how to how to use them. And uh, most recently, I was a group therapist in outpatient, inpatient hospitals when I was living in Portland, Oregon. And it was very gratifying work, 
what I realized after maybe six months, I, I don't feel like I'm doing a lot for my patients, for my clients. Saybrook was always this thing that was on the periphery of, of my knowledge of all the reading that I would do. All the psychologists that I read are faculty and or alumni from Saybrook. I was very familiar with, with Dr. Schneider's work and Rollo May and James Budenthal. And growing up in the Bay Area, I was aware of Saybrook when it was located there. And I, I know they did the uh, residential conferences not far from where I grew up in Burlingame. And so I sat down with my, my fiance um, about a year and a half ago and said, I'd like to go back to school. I know this is a big undertaking for our family. And she said, do it. Um, so I applied and, and here we are. And yeah, what got me involved with, with Dr. Schneider specifically was he had posted something in the early stages for core of depth healers. And I, I reached out and, you know, not being at the, a brick and mortar university, I, I really want to take these opportunities when they come to me. And I, we exchanged some emails and I kind of compiled it together in a PowerPoint and just bugged him enough to say, let me, let me, let me help you. Uh, I, I'm very passionate about the things that you're, you're talking about and I'd love to be a part of it. I feel honored to be able to, to meet with him and, and work on these things together. I just want to quickly, I, I, I'm very heartened that Tyler has come on board. He's been wonderful in giving input and you know, ideas for the channel. And uh, we have further plans for incorporating. Yes, we do. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to dig into that in a, in a hot minute uh, around that. And you'll have to take this episode and we'll give you the raw footage so you can load that onto your site yeah. as well. A little cross Me promotion. Too. That would be yeah. terrific. I was uh, intrigued by a lot of the the video uh, playlist that you've started to put together and I would encourage people to go there. We'll have the link in the show notes along with um, promoting that here at the end of the podcast. Tyler, I have one essential question though, before we get into the meat of the interview, you're a musician. So am I. I know. What are, what, what's your uh, instrument of poison or your uh, work of poison, if you will? Well, uh, originally it's um, bass, bass guitar, and an upright bass. And so that's what I was studying jazz performance in, in college. So a lot of uh, a lot of Miles Davis and Weather Report. Uh, and then, you know, over the years, just playing in bands and um, just picking up guitar as well. And then as a music major, they really instill in you that they, they want you to know how to play piano. Um, so there was a lot of that, like very rudimentary, you know, where you where you can really play on your given instrument, but you're taking like piano one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, well, I don't really consider it uh, in in my tool bag, but I have some knowledge of the keyboard. Yeah, I I'm not even remotely knowing enough to be dangerous in the piano domain. I could never get the the coordination right. Well, yeah. Well, it's great. It's great. The creative impulse there is important in our work and uh even though you're not doing it professionally it's it's an important outlet if you still do play a little so that's yeah. great that's right so i really want to dive into kirk i was watching a bit of your channel i've read some of your website clearly i've read a few of your books and you've started to introduce some you maybe not introduce but reintroduce terminology that's intriguing to me i first want to start with this notion or concept of life of or life enhancing not life affirming but life enhancing anxiety what in the world does that mean it sounds scary but it actually as, you know as i listen to you talk i'm like that actually makes a lot of sense so for our audience could we start there maybe and then get into depth daily yeah please yeah well it, it's the topic of my latest book life enhancing anxiety key to a sane world and basically i am Taking a cue from my great mentor, Rollo May, who wrote The Meaning of Anxiety, talking about the many dimensions of anxiety that we often don't focus on in our culture and similar cultures. We tend to focus on, you know, the dreadful part 
and the, the, the terror and, and overwhelm of the unknown. Basically, I'll define anxiety as terror of the unknown. And I think it's a very primal terror. And it's very adaptive terror. Also, it's 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 uh, what the evolutionists call signal anxiety at one level. You know, it warns us that there's a tiger in the woods, and we start sweating, our heart starts racing, and we're bracing ourselves either to flee, which we usually do, or fight. So it's a very basic uh, signal. However, there is a great deal of anxiety in our society that is more symbolic and does not have to do with immediate threats, and that can actually, if we develop the equipment to work with it, can help us to be in wonder about that which is unknown, that which is other or different, and, and also be in a mode of discovery about that which is unknown and different. And I say primal because I do connect more and more from my studies with Otto Rank's idea of the trauma of birth as being the template for virtually all subsequent anxiety and trauma. That radical separation between <clears throat> relative unity, relative non-being and unity that we begin with coming out of the mother, of course, but also from a broader existential view coming out of the mystery of the cosmos to sudden abrupt being and pandemonium. And of course, at that phase, when we are thrown into the world, we are most vulnerable. And so the whole question is how, how are we met at that point by our caretakers and by the culture at large, such that we develop equipment, develop tools to work with uh, that basic uh, tension between, between us and that which is unknown and therefore very threatening. It's where we first learn about you know, fears of, of death and fears of physical threat, but also psych psychological threat. If the mother is absent or the parents absent for a period of time, or there's illness, any great disruption from the safe and familiar can put us into the state of groundlessness and helplessness, as I put it, which is very connected to much that the psychoanalysts now talk about in terms of insecure and secure attachments, and terror management folks talk about in terms of death anxiety. So there's a lot of research to back this up. It's very deep, and, and I think this is why uh, so many uh, of our so much of our world is uh, is anxious uh, around people, places, and things that are different from us and other, and and how quickly these uncomfortable ideas and conversations devolve, precisely because they are so primal, and we haven't learned on um, stay with it, work with it, develop practice. So, Dr. Schneider, I, I think one for the lay person out there who's saying, okay, that that's amazing because it is it's like the way you frame that is really helpful from a practical point of view. Like if you said, here's a, a, a very tangible, very um, clear example of life enhancing anxiety. What would that look like in, in, in the world today to someone who's asked, you know, wondering what that actually how that shows up in the world? Does that make sense? Well, I can draw from my, my own case, in a sense, my own situation. I went through a, a very trying trauma at a very young age, around two and a half. My seven-year-old brother died of a 10-month-long process that involved all kinds of upheavals among my parents, my mother being away for periods of time. Tremendous fear of the unknown and filling that in with all kinds of monstrosities and threats in my own way of being and living. 
Uh, and I was not really able to get somewhat of a grip on it until uh, I was referred to a, a psychoanalyst at a very young age. I entered into psychoanalysis at six. And a lot of what I learned there, be began to learn, was what I'd call life-enhancing anxiety, which I'd define as the capacity to live with and make the best of the depth and mystery of existence. Or to put it more concretely, the capacity to live with and make the best of that which is radically unknown and ungraspable in a sense. Again, echoing our earliest entry into this world. Yeah, thank you for that. Tyler, you've heard Dr. Schneider provide that beautiful uh, introduction here, an ex explanation. How does life enhancing anxiety show up for you? I mean, in terms of how you think of it and how it frames for you in your own practice. Yeah. I, first, I want to underline something that he had mentioned that about anxiety and how it differs from fear, with fear being something specific. And I look at life enhancing anxiety and, and think about what Rollo says about it, this, this opportunity for creativity. What can I do with this? How can this help me? I see it with uh, with performance in things. If, if I'm worried about how I may perform and I'm feeling this anxiety, you can take two paths. You can avoid it for fear of how you might perform. Oh, I don't think I'll do well, so I'll find a reason to not do it. Or you go into it and say this opportunity, like this, for example, you know? Yeah. So, but the opportunity that, I, that can come from this is big. And, and I see that with I, I do uh, ultra marathons, so race foot races past the the twenty six point two mile distance, and you know talk about uh, life enhancing anxiety. There are many, yeah, there are many opportunities to 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 stop. To, the excuses to say, why am I doing this? What am I getting out of this? The intentional challenge and. What I learned from that on the other end is, is so rewarding. It's one of the things that, that Dr. Schneider mentioned that I connected with was this idea of life enhancing anxiety and seeing that kind of thread uh, between Rollo May and, and, uh, and where Dr. Schneider is taking it now. That's beautiful. That's really great. I appreciate that. That's a, a really good, uh, you know, furtherance of, of Dr. Schneider's foundation there. So, Tyler, I'm going to stick with you for a minute, and then we're going to switch over to Dr. Schneider a bit. Yeah, you're in the hot seat. You're a first-year PhD student in psychology, so um, you're being graded right now. Uh, <laughs> pass, no pass, right? Yeah, yeah, pass, no pass. You're good. We grade on a big curve here, uh, so you're also yeah. Um, in terms of life-enhancing anxiety and depth healing, so now we're going to get into the concept of depth healing. What, how do those two connect? But I think before we get into the connection, what is depth healing? And I'm sure you'll make the connections to depth healing in a, in a minute, or maybe there, there are tangentials that you want to go down. So maybe take it away. Give it a whirl. I, I, would, I think he, uh, Dr. Schneider has a, a, probably a better way of describing depth healing than I would at this point, because I want to encompass uh, really what he's truly uh, aiming for here. Um, so if, if you would mentor Schneider, you are taking on death healing. So. <laughs> well, I'd like to hear more of what you have to say about it, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> Just generally define depth, depth as that which is hidden in the psyche, in our experience, that which is implicit. And again, I think it harks back to these very primal terrors of the unknown, of that which is other and different, both within ourselves and the world. And uh, I, I see a lot of the task of the depth healer, the depth therapist, as helping people to reconnect with those very primal anxieties. Those who are able to and willing to reconnect with those very primal anxieties through cultivation of presence, greater presence, greater awareness, not just intellectually or behaviorally of how we're conditioned 
or can be reconditioned on the outward side, but with our whole body experience. So I call it a reoccupation project, basically helping people to reoccupy both literally and figuratively parts of themselves that they cut off and that, again, often are rooted in these deepest struggles, terrors. And it's really about um, helping us to become more free, to achieve more of an inner freedom, to, to connect with our most vulnerable sides, because that's a very integral part of life as well, as well as our most venturesome risk-taking sides. And so this takes some work. This is a lot of what we're attempting to exemplify for people, how people can translate uh, depth principles of practice, again, to social crises. Uh, and, and one of them is a, a crisis of meaning and purpose, creativity, clearly, the more one can live on the edge of wonder and discovery, the more one is capable of being creative, innovative, uh, and, and also enter into more loving, meaningful relationships with people. Because again, you're more comfortable with the discomfort, right? And with those edges of freedom. Rollo talked about anxiety as the flip side of freedom. I think that's a really powerful point. So it's, it, it can be a signal of deepening and, again, of achieving this much greater range of inner freedom as well as outer, which relates to creativity and, and also to bridge-building dialogues, which we could get into later as well. Be more comfortable with very uncomfortable conversations between people of very different backgrounds. And to learn something. Something good. I was um, talking to a colleague of mine who's a therapist, not at Saybrook, but just broadly, and we were talking about, I engaged in my own therapeutic work, I guess, in terms of uh, participating in it as a client. And yeah, I was expressing my sort of frustration at the approach. I The, the therapist, and it's not the therapist so much as the approach they're using, which is CBT, uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, and one of the, the things that my colleague said to me is you, you, you really ought to try depth based therapy or depth therapy, um, because CBT covers it's, it's useful in certain things, no doubt about that, but the, the depth therapy really digs into that area of your, who you are really internally. It really kind of carves into that and says, how do you know who you are? What makes you uh, you? And I said, I said to him, that sounds incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and he yeah, said, yeah. it is, but it's fabulous once you get to the, you know, that next step. And I, I said, you know, I, I will, I, I, I actually said I'm meeting with the, uh, with the two of you today, and uh, he said uh, you'll, you, you'll be, you'll learn a lot, and you, you'll probably be in depth therapy before you know it. So um, I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying because so much therapy um this is not a criticism and correct me if i'm wrong here you know sometimes you go in to solve a certain problem or an issue but it still is masking the 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 deeper self-relational things that are happening inside you that you have yet to really explore is that fair to put i i'm not saying it in yeah, no, I think it's very sure. I, I, I also I can see myself an existential integrative therapist. So I'm very open to utilizing other bona fide approaches as relevant for that person. However, I do think that many, many people are cheated by seeing that those very programmatic approaches as the be all and end all. They're cheated of the opportunity to go deeper, meaning that depth experiential therapists not only look at the words that people say about their struggle or how they report about it or even ways of interpreting it, but what is going on inside their body as they're speaking their struggle. Because calling attention to 
feelings, body sensations, imaginings, opens that whole realm of the inner life that we want to help people get to, to again, to be able to reoccupy these very core wounds that we all experience, but are exacerbated, you know, more or less depending on the kind of traumas you've experienced. But yes, it's a, it's a broader and deeper focus. Indeed, indeed. So you've proposed something pretty, in my view, radical, which I love, which is a national core. I think on your video you said a core of mental health healers, um, but also core of depth healers uh, initiative. Could you speak to the vision uh, or the why behind this? And, and what is your intention? What do you think? Well, the why uh, should be quite evident to most of us in, in terms of looking at the world today. Uh, we have two tremendous wars going on right now. Precisely, I think we have so much violence, war, you know, racism, bigotry, and personal psychopathology precisely because we're not dealing with the anxieties that underlie these later anxieties that, that become anxieties because people have been terrified of dealing with the basic earlier anxieties like coming to terms with the, that which is unknown, that which is foreign, different. And so we react against it with a great deal of destructiveness often. We're devaluing the other. So we can avoid opening up those uncomfortable ideas and conversations, feeling. So uh, that's really what I, I, I think is happening there. We've got a seven alarm fire in the world in terms of all those areas. And I'm trying to do my part, and I know Tyler's trying to do his part, to, to bring the fire hose <laughs> to the situation. Uh, some Something on the par of, of a Marshall Plan, uh, you know, Peace Corps, uh, an army of depth healers to to provide an alternative to the, the usual more militaristic ways that we deal with these problems, which are dealing with the underlying problems. So, uh, yeah, so my hope, my vision is that uh, the idea of a Corps of Depth Healers is they will mobilize, it will rally mental health professionals in particular or those who are trained in depth healing to provide their work to much broader and diverse clientele in an, in an affordable and accessible way. It's much more affordably and accessible. And, uh, and to do that uh, in the area of uh, providing more longer-term in-depth psychotherapy, especially to marginalized communities who don't have the advantage that a number of us have had in having these longer-term, more intensive relationships with people that have more enduring effects, at least in my experience, often than the short-term solution-focused therapies. And, and in the area of, of mentoring and life coaching, uh, organizational well-being. I mean, this could this, these depth dimensions could be applied in many, many areas. Child rearing, educational system. Across the board. The yeah. government yeah. system. Yeah. Across the board. So volunteers who would, who would be trying to attempt to give people to volunteer, even a fragment of their time to providing the, this, this kind of depth work. And uh, also trying to mobilize funding as we evolve. I have an idea that we can talk about after the after we're uh, done today. I'm I'm motivated. Okay. Dr. Schneider. That's really good. So we convinced him. Let's bookmark that. <laughs> I think you may have a little <laughs> yes. Tyler t Tyler, you uh you you've joined this movement. And I'm curious what spoke to you about joining this movement. Clearly you have a connect you like uh a connection to Rollo May, James Bugenthal, and the history and legacy and working with Dr. Schneider. But this in particular speaks to you in some way. What is it? 
when I first became aware of those psychologists, and I, I had a connection with them as well with Dr. Schneider's writings, realizing in myself, wow, there's someone else that thinks the way that I do about things. And I felt uh, kind of a sadness that it wasn't something that was being done on a greater scale, kind of like this top-down approach of we know so much about you know, what we can do in this arena of depth psychology. And usually it's done one-on-one -on -one in a, cons a consultation room, maybe in a group setting. Why can't these principles be be applied on the bigger uh, stage with curriculum, uh, you know, child rear or um, raising. Yeah. 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 And education and all these other areas. So there was this big disconnect and it was something that I would think about. And again, it, it when, when Dr. Schneider posted this, uh, and at the time it was actually core of depth psychologists very briefly. And I think rightfully so he changed it to healers to, to encompass other areas that aren't just psychology. I said, this is real social action happening here. It's not just theory, like, oh, look at all the stuff that we know, but what's being done? And to be able to, to you know, hitch my wagon to, yeah, I mean, anybody that's doing that, let alone somebody that I, I look up to. And um, again, I'm so, you know, honored to be able to be involved with. So there was a, there was a lot for me to, uh, to pursue this. And it's something that I'm very interested in. What can I do? I, you know, I don't want to just learn a lot about psychology and, um, and, and, and leave it in that theoretical arena. I want to do something with it. Which, frankly, is the, one of the core reasons I joined or came to Saybrook, even though I'm in the administration side of things, to watch folks like yourself, Tyler, and Dr. Schneider come in and envision a new world and or a a different world where we can be applying that research in a unique and sustainable way. And yet sometimes it doesn't work, but you've got to try these things to see what can be accomplished, uh, fail fast even, and then figure out what might work on the next round. But uh, I, I really applaud that. As we, you know, I want to kind of take a moment, and then unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time here, but Kirk, you mentioned you wanted to bring this work to underserved communities and make it accessible and affordable. And you're making a call for volunteers, which all those things are very essential. I'm just thinking like right now, um, I'm in the throes of planning or in the final planning stages of a national campaign for integrative health, right? So which encompasses mental health and uh, wellness, well-being. And the statistics are pretty grim about therapists out there, right? So we have more therapists leaving the profession than going in. Please don't leave if you're a Saybrook student. We need you. That's why we're training therapists. Um, but, but the field needs more people to serve a burgeoning need across this country and around the globe. Um, and I'm not trying to, you, you can't fix it all, Kirk, I know. But, but what are your thoughts given the dearth of therapists, number one? And number two, the accessibility and affordability piece. What are some, and I, I apologize for making you do this on the quick, uh, but some quick thoughts on on those topics, if you don't mind. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that something like this idea of core of depth healers will, will turn on, will energize, especially our young people, to see a new meaning to, to their career as therapists. Not that, you know, the one-on-one -on -one consulting room context is is bad in any way. It's helped to save my life in major ways. However, it's just that we have so much more to give. And the the kind of examples that we provide, the video examples we provide on the Core Deaf Healers YouTube channel, hopefully can spark the imagination of people considering going into the field, going more deeply into the field, especially given all the, the violence, the war, the, the the hatred and bigotry that is permeating our society, the political and cultural divisiveness. I think what greater motive could one have than to want to try to address that before it's too late? 
we're in a race against time, and I think that's a really important part of this. So I'm, I'm hoping that that will also spark people to get more involved in you know, becoming a therapist and learning basic skills, especially, especially depth-oriented skills, and for themselves too. And that's really where it begins. One needs to come to terms with one's own terror of the unknown in oneself and the otherness in oneself. Well, so we need to, to strategize ways in which to help make this achievable, uh, workable uh, for the future for, for our country and for our globe. So uh, stay tuned for more on that. So unfortunately, uh, we're bringing this to a close. Is there anything you would like to point people towards in terms of websites, materials, et cetera, that would really call out attention to this and more education for uh, our viewers and listeners? Well, I would just say initially to please check out our new YouTube channel called Core of Depth Healers and, and sample some of the videos. I mean, maybe sample my initial overview, my introduction to the channel and my overview about anxiety and life-enhancing anxiety how core that is, in my view, to helping to heal our world, our communities. Uh, but also, there's so many samples of very prominent depth-oriented therapists applying their work to social crises, from, from Carl Rogers to Arnie Mandel, uh, Bill Doherty of Braver Angels, who applies their supportive structured dialogues, to couples who are polarized, to groups that are conservative, liberal, et cetera. It's very wide ranging. To, to dance and movement therapy, uh, we have Eileen Serlin presents some skills in, in addressing trauma through movement. We address gun violence from a depth psychodynamic point of view. So that that's uh, a place uh, that I think people can get a lot out of. Uh, Tyler, do you have some thoughts uh, about what people should seek out. Yeah, definitely the, the YouTube channel. And moving forward, we're going to start to have, I think, guests on, and we can uh, I'll, I'll talk to them about something that they're doing that is using these uh, tools and applying them in depth psychology, probably short, very short form, um, just to highlight, uh, you know, like, like Kirk said, with uh, Eileen Serlin, with dance movement for, for trauma and microaggressions uh nathaniel granger there's a lot of work there so a, a lot of important things to be highlighted that may not be as obvious when we talk about how do you apply depth psychology to the social crises of our of our times but we can look at it from a lot of different angles and these little chunks of what can we do differently and uh, yeah and stay tuned for you know for more videos that we're um, compiling right now it's a big repository of resources and we're hoping to expand on that. Well, I will definitely cross promote that in our Saybrook podcast network. Uh, so if you'd like, we can put that in there and continue to push out this good work. We're going to unfortunately have to bring it to a close here, gentlemen, but I have two questions that I ask of all my guests. And today I get a two for one um, with uh, both of you. These are very quick takes. So, the first things that come to mind, and you're not being graded, and Kirk, you 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 get a second or third pass at this, man. So you know <laughs> this is really good. So we're gonna let Kirk start, and Tyler, that'll give you time to queue up your answer. Kirk, what does the term humanistic mean to you? Well, it it means what does it mean to be fully experientially human, and how does that apply to the vital or uh, enriching life. And, and so that's a very quick definition. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it's about attempting to learn about and support the, the whole human being, the whole human experience to the degree possible. I think that's pretty fabulous, Dr. Schneider. And for you, what are three things today someone can do uh, to advance their own mental, emotional well-being or to help improve the world or make it a better place from your perspective? For me, I would say, first of all, 
do everything you can to take at least one time per week to clear out your your cell phones and your all of your uh, you know <laughs> business commitments etc be in an undistracted place whether that's taking a walk or somewhere in your in your home residence and reflect on what is what's what's this all about for you right now what what deeply matters about your life and take some time even even 10 or 15 minutes to not just think about it, but see what, what comes up in your body as you're thinking about what deeply matters and, and how you might uh, follow through with, with what comes up in terms of your, the signals in your body, your, your imaginings, your feelings, especially. Uh, and, and also, uh, I would say, enter into depth experiential therapy if you can, uh, and especially if if you're wanting to go more deeply into this work, I think that's absolutely integral to, to find a therapeutic situation where a therapist is a full human being with you, as well as having skills to help you work at the embodied level, not just parts of yourself. And uh, finally, I would say uh, try to apply these depth principles as we've done in, on the YouTube channel uh, in your households or in your communities at the work setting if, if relevant within yourself uh, try to develop skills of becoming more present within yourself and, and toward the world and uh, I think taking it out to the larger community can bring so much gratification for you and so much meaning, especially at these dire times. That is really quite wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Tyler, you're going to run us out today, sir. Yeah. What does the term humanistic mean to you? Uh, often we hear you know, the, the whole person, looking at the whole person. And I would agree with that. I would go one step further and say, approaching that experience with curiosity, when Kirk talks about awe. So how did this person come to be? And how are they continuing to be in that place? So what is holding um, these things up for them uh, moving forward? And what what three things? Yeah, what are three things you, an individual can do right now? Someone who's listening to you to improve their mental health and well-being or help make the world better. Well, I would agree with Kirk on this one, obviously. Getting into therapy, uh, I, I met with Irv Yalom for a consultation. And he, he one of the greatest things he said was, the world would be a better place if we were all in therapy. Uh, and he said, if you're not right now, you should be. And so I, I would say that's a big one. And whatever that looks like, maybe it's counseling, and that could be in a religious form, but but some sort of of uh, from counseling. Um, getting out in nature, or again, Kirk talks about museums and nature being our temples, and going out and spending time worshiping, whatever that looks like in those settings. And finally, I'd say doing something difficult daily. Do something that you don't want to. And for me, that comes in the form of these absurd long-form foot races because I don't need to do it. But whatever that looks like, and maybe going into therapy is that, but doing something that's difficult and, and not shying away from that anxiety. That's great. That speaks to creative project also. Yeah. I mean, right at the heart of it. Tyler Gamlin, Dr. Kirk Schneider, it has been a joy. We didn't go as deep into depth therapy as we could have, but we got a little closer today on the topic. Uh, Core of Depth Healers YouTube channel. Check it out. Dr. Schneider has a wonderful intro and a few uh, new videos that are posted. 
Uh, Tyler, new student, good luck to you. You're going to do fabulously at Saybrook. I have every confidence you're going to uh, be the next generation of Rollo May, et cetera, along with Dr. Schneider. We're, we're going to see some great things, and uh, we got a lot of work to do. So everyone listening, let's get to work. Let's keep working. Let's focus on what we can do together. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Jim. Thank you for bringing this to our Sabra community to enlarge our vision. Absolutely. I hope you enjoy both Kirk and Tyler as much as I did. Um, I have to pun here. That was really deep, right? No. Anyway, that was really terrific. I hope you learned a lot. I learned so much. And there's so much to this. I really hope you'll take some time to explore uh, the YouTube channel that Dr. Schneider and Tyler mentioned today. Remember each uh, of their takeaways. So I'm going to go through each. Dr. Kirk Schneider said, take at least one day, some time each week, and reflect on what is this all about for you right now? What deeply matters to you? Really think on that. Number two, enter into depth experiential therapy if you can, if you want to go more deeply in this work in this self-work. And number three, try to apply these depth principles in your household and communities. Really try and get your arms around that and apply it. And Tyler brought up getting into therapy. He agreed with Dr. Schneider there. He also brought up an, a very popular one on this show, getting out in nature. And I really liked how he framed this. Taking time for yourself and going out, spending time worshiping whatever is in those natural settings and do something daily you don't want to do something that's difficult take the challenge every day if you want to see the youtube version please visit our saybrook youtube page if you'd like to support the podcast go to apple itunes and leave a five star rating and review and subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out if you're on spotify leave a five star rating and make sure to follow us you can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google, Stitcher, Pandora, and many others. Remember to check our show notes for information on today's guests, including links to their website and books and the like. For more about our university, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on areas of study at the top of the page and locate the program of your choice to learn more. With respect to this particular episode, just look up Saybrook University Psychology, or simply Google Saybrook University. That's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take care and be well.